I think I would say a movie. Um, I saw um, a film, uh, Lawrence of Arabia, when I was um, a boy. And in those days, before streaming, um, you saw films on the big screen. And I saw Lawrence of Arabia on a big screen with that fantastic sound, with the intermission, um, with the exquisite uh, music in those locations. And it wasn't just, um, it was a, a good story. So much emphasis among filmmakers or film educators about story. I think what they fail to recognize is the visceral experience of film that really seduces us. So when I saw that enormous image with the spectacular sound and the remarkable locations, I physically responded to it. It wasn't like, oh, what an interesting man or what a, a fantastic uh, ripping good yarn. Um, I just felt um, I was transported into some uh, magical world but it was more physical than an intellectual reaction. And that's what I think a lot of people fail to recognize about the experience of cinema. And then it was replicated in um, other uh, childhood movies. Um, and then even in my early adulthood, um, I saw years later a film called Days of Heaven, which to my mind is still the best uh, photographed film of all time, in my view anyway. And I was so amazed at um, what, Nestor Benjos, the cinematographer that piece did, that not only was my enthusiasm uh, about cinema further wetted, but I was very interested in the visual side of it. Now, what was anomalous was that all my skill sets were in writing. Um, I was mainly interested in, in um, literature and I was writing um, fiction, um, you know, short stories, and, and then later a lot of plays. But my enthusiasm was for the visual, not anticipating that years later, um, I would combine my interest in these two separate but related languages, because both the visual image and the written word encode ideas, albeit in slightly different ways. It's the same essential concept as taking some abstraction and then finding an objective correlative, finding a way to represent that abstraction to an audience. So in my case, it was with uh, initially with the visual image, with composition and lighting and camera movement, which is what a cinematographer does. But then subsequently, I combined it with my other skill set and I was uh, writing as well. So I have my characters speaking and the ideas illustrated both through the visual and then through what they say. Well, um, originally I've been trained as a writer, was very active in, in, in theater, um, uh, but um, I had access to some cameras. It's, it's funny how these things happen. And I always say to young filmmakers who think that buying a piece of equipment is going to transmogrify their life, that it's not about owning equipment, it's about understanding um, the craft or understanding the art. Uh, but in my particular case, uh, somebody wanted to shoot um, this radical new concept on film, um, which was you take a band and you film the band and then you send that to an a and company, to an a and representative at a record company. And maybe they sign the band to a, a record contract or there's a band that has a record contract and you, you put these videos out and that increases the enthusiasm for the band. And this was in England um, in the late seventies, early eighties. And suddenly that became a phenomenon and before I knew what was happening, I was shooting lots of these music videos and they became hugely popular. And then suddenly the commercials industry was looking at people who were making music videos and saw it as either cutting edge or representative of the new zeitgeist and uh, began hiring me. And then I worked with a guy named Tony Kay, um, who was legendary in the commercials world. And we did some commercials that won the Khan Gold Lion and the D&D &D Awards. And then suddenly I was doing you know, commercials all the time. Then um, somebody said, well, you should shoot a feature. And then I was shooting uh, a feature and then another feature. And then a friend of mine uh, was doing a project in Mexico, hoped to do a project in Mexico and was uh, offered another film in America. 
so passed on the little independent in Mexico and asked me to shoot it. And that was uh, like water for chocolate. And that became this phenomena in America, the highest grossing foreign language film of all time to that day. And um, it was a great opportunity to photograph something elegantly because it was um, a painterly film, um, photographed painterly. Uh, and in the uh, desert near a place called Junia in uh, Mexico. And um, that took me to Los Angeles where um, I got offered a, a lot of work. I worked with um, uh, Noah Bombeck on his first three uh, independent films. And Noah went on, of course, to become a uh, two-time Oscar nominee, um, and that led to studio films with Ernest Dickerson and then, you know, White Chicks and uh, that monster which won the Oscar and so on. So um, all the while, I was still writing. I wrote a book in there, was still writing plays, uh, was writing a lot of screenplays, but um, I didn't really want to um, direct in that sense, um, even though I had lots of experience directing actors on stage, because I saw that film directors, um, it was like seven years between projects. You would write something or you would get some script and then you have to raise the money, which is and remains a soul destroying undertaking. So I still feel most alive when I'm on a film set. And as a cinematographer, you work doing three films a year, maybe in some commercials. As a director, you do one film every seven years, you know, do the math, <laughs> um, but Monster was such a, ph a phenomenon, and everybody knew that I wrote in the book um, about universities. Uh, a lot of people who thought they knew it was best for my life better than I said, "You really have to, um, you know, direct not just on stage, but for film." So that led to um, Cody Annie Parker with uh, Samantha Morton and Helen Hunt and uh, Aaron Paul, and that led to my new film Last Call, and that led to. TV series I'm doing now and all the rest of it. About writing, um, I, I, uh, I think of Dorothy Parker, who said she loves having written, she hates writing. So um, I love having written and people um, like my writing uh, a lot. So that's the thing that's driving my career at the moment is that um, I've got more demand for my scripts than I can produce. Um, so, and then I'm very proud of what I write, but the process of being locked in a room uh, with an approaching deadline uh, and the temptation of the internet with, um, you know, the enthusiasm you discover on the internet when you've got something to write um, are, 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 are legion. Um, you know, anything besides, uh, you know, writing. I'll be looking up, you know, the, the uh, uh, agrarian output of, you know, obscure African nations, anything uh, as opposed to, to actually producing a script. So, but when I write something, there's things that gives me, I think to this day, the, the greatest pride. In terms of moment to moment pleasure, um, nothing can beat directing actors. Um, I love the interaction. I love the um, seemingly magical change that occurs when um, their vision and mine conjoin and we discover something new about a character uh, while we're uh, building um, uh, the, the, the narrative together. Um, I don't rehearse, uh, I don't like rehearsals, um, uh, but I provide backstory and then we get together on the day and we uh, discover what the scene is about and what the character's motivations uh, um, and needs and obstacles are, and that's d delightful and pleasurable. And then when you film it, uh, there's a, an energy that is just, just absolutely magical. But in terms of, if I had to make a life choice about how I could be, be happiest, because sometimes the things that give us the greatest pleasure don't lead to our greatest happiness, cinematography is tremendous because um, when you create a great image or composition, the visceral delight, um, is palatable and um, you uh, really enjoy it. And it comes without 
profound responsibilities. I mean, you're still responsible for the image, you still have a crew to run, and um, there are difficulties. But when you acquire a certain level of skill, um, it's not so much about the effort um, as about the ambition. And then, um, and it's obtainable, and it's pal palpable, and, and uh, it's ostensible. You, you see what you've done, and you delight in it. Um, you create something that's really beautiful. And when I shot Monster, we decided to do so much of it handheld to um, facilitate the acting um, and to give it that rough, um, uh, tattered sort of emotional edge with, with uh, using a color um, and um, using that fluid camera movement and using um, hard uh, backlighting and so on. Uh, and then you see the result and uh, you don't have to worry about raising money or selling it or any of that other stuff um, that you have to worry about as a director. It's just delightful. Um, so, uh, you know, I didn't really give you an answer. I mean, each has its virtues. Uh, writing is the hardest. Um, directing has a great spiritual return, but in terms of uh, a life choice, uh, probably uh, be a cinematographer. Um, have a lot of uh, uh, positive uh, feedback, visceral delights, and uh, fewer responsibilities. I used to think, pretentiously, that the dramas were somehow more important than the comedies. But as I've gotten older, um, and I realize um, the difficulty that life presents and the the agonies, small and large. Um, I now probably take greater pride in the comedies because they give uh, succor and delight to people um, in dark times. So when I go around the world lecturing in different places, um, uh, I always talk about like Water for Chocolate and I talk about uh, Monster and I talk about semiology and structuralism and the nature of language and um, wax poetical and then wait for the weighty and significant questions and then we pause and some hand goes up and inevitably and invariably the first question is what was it like shooting white chicks <laughs> so I used to think oh my god what's wrong with these people don't they understand these heavy issues that I'm uh, examining um, I mean my the new film you know last call is about uh, best performance I've ever uh, evolved with an actor, best performance I've ever seen on, on a soundstage with Risa Fons as Dylan Thomas. I mean, it is um, the best performance I've ever seen. And John Malkovich is fantastic. And um, it's the best writing I've ever done. And so for all those reasons, um, I want to talk about that as much as possible. But I realize it's not a film you go to with the family to um, you know, to delight in, in the, the sensual plenty that is that is living. But when people see white chicks, they do something really sacred. They laugh. They laugh and they forget um, and they uh, renew. And what better thing for a piece of art to do um, than to allow us to both forget and to renew us. So now I've decided I'm kind of proud of the comedies and I'm happy that with Waterboy and and scary movie and white chicks and little man, um, I've contributed to a lot of a lot of laughter. Um, I think independent films are more fun um, because everything is about the quality of what you're undertaking, uh, and you have a level of freedom that you don't have when you're working for studios. The advantage of working for studios is you have more toys, uh, bigger crews. Um, I shot the action sequences on SWAT and you know, we had over 20 cameras running lots of the time, blowing things up, uh, uh, stunt stuff, uh, visual effects. It's, you know, it's fun, absolutely. But um, you're part of a machine and a very expensive machine and you're carefully scrutinized and um, there's limits to the amount of joy that you can extract from that. So I think independents are creatively more satisfying um, and studio work is more remunerative. Look, I saw so much of myself in, in, in Dylan Thomas. Um, uh, he, he writes lyrical poetry, which 
uh, I think by its nature is seductive. And I mean seductive here in the broadest sense, which is causing people to respond to you um, by, uh, I, I say this cautiously because I just said that I relate to him, but uh, <laughs> by, by kind of a, a manipulation um, that you, uh, there's an American expression, pushing someone's buttons, but um, I think that you can push another person's buttons and anticipate um, a conditioned response from them. Um, you may not be doing it consciously, but it's still by its nature seduction because um, you are not investing yourself um, in that, um, that relationship. I used to call it a, a drive-by seduction. That is, uh, you say some charming things, you're, you're funny, you're, um, you're vulnerable, um, and then suddenly people, you cause people to like you, but they don't know you. Um, I make it sound rather banal, but I think it is, uh, it's more significant than that. I think when you uh, are have celebrity, um, you can seduce uh, people on a grand scale. Um, actors who are celebrities um, very often are seducers and seductresses because um, they are causing people to like them or love them, uh, but they're not really known by um, their fan base. Um, and that is the very nature of seduction. The difference between intimacy and seduction is significant. In intimacy, you know your partner, you know their real nature, and a real nature is rarely perfect. Um, and it means making yourself vulnerable, but there's a truth and a connection um, from that vulnerability. Uh, someone like Dylan Thomas then um, didn't want genuine intimacy because of his vulnerabilities. I think he drank uh, for that reason. I think he um, created lyrical poems in part because uh, he wanted to seduce. And I, he, the person he wanted to seduce the most was himself. Um, when you look at a Charles Christmas in Wales, um, this is this idealized world, which in fact didn't exist, didn't exist in the actual world and certainly didn't exist in Dylan Thomas' own life. But he makes us believe that it did and maybe he was trying to make himself believe that he had this idyllic uh, childhood. And that led me to an understanding, not only of seduction, but of myth, which is um, we are our own myth makers. And so Dylan Thomas through his poems uh, was both seducing and creating myths and that allowed him to function. And I think there, for the grace of God, go all of us to a greater or lesser degree. And he, for me, became emblematic of a great many ideas, but, but certainly emblematic of the way I, self, myself, uh, I, I myself function in this world, which is um, careening wildly between genuine intimacy and then collective seductions. Uh, you know, the public self where um, I try to be appealing, um, but it bears very little genuine correspondence to my true nature. Um, and then um, making myself vulnerable and then getting damaged by my vulnerability. Um, those things to me were absolutely fascinating. And then also uh, finally for him, uh, the fact that he was self-destructive. Um, again, in my youth, I saw parts of myself in that. And I wonder at this strange and most anomalous of characteristics that um, when we're here to delight in the sensual pleasures of which we can avail ourselves in the world, um, why many of us become self-destructive. Um, you know, what is the appeal in destroying the very vessel of the thing that gives us pleasure? But we do. So um, all those reasons uh, showed for me a way, uh, you know, a window into the human condition, um, which artists, uh, particularly vulnerable ones, unintentionally vulnerable ones, um, provide us. And I thought through the examination of his life, the man, um, as well as the writer, um, something could be discovered of worth. Um, and it was a great journey for me. You know, I, I, ultimately we all write about ourselves, but as I wrote about him, I guess I was writing about myself and about my own seductive nature, about my own um, discomfort in genuine intimacy, uh, my own self-destruction, um, all those things.
And I think I overthink things too much, but I, I it, it went to the nature of my character. As for people loving the film, it's very interesting the reaction. The people who love it, um, love it. Um, and the people who don't, don't. The people who are looking for uh, a, uh, a rom-com are going to be disappointed. Um, uh, you know, and the people who want a biopic are going to be very disappointed. But people who still view film as art and you know, want uh, complex examinations of uh, our shared condition um, will like it. So here in, in Spain, the major daily paper, I guess, apparently I haven't seen a review yet, uh, you know, said it was the best film of the festival. Um, and then other people said uh, just really way too dark and painful to watch. Uh, I think it's quite comic. There's a lot of comedy in it. I mean, John Malkovich is a great comic actor. Uh, Reese is a great comic actor, but um, you know, overall the, the takeaway is, uh, you know, parts of this are painful. Well, looking at our natures can sometimes be a painful thing, but sometimes a good thing. Thousands, um, yeah, I mean, that's all I do is look, I spend a lifetime looking at movies and, and, and reading. Um, um, obviously we talked about Lawrence of Arabia, so David Lean, um, you know, hugely uh, important to me. Um, I, I, I loved Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, um, you know, and I, I still study that as an example of a great use of, of writing to illustrate a character and then uh, examine uh, bigger ideas. You want to learn the first rule you'd know if you ever spent a day in your life. You never open your mouth till you know what the shot is. I had the great good fortune of, of knowing uh, uh, David Mamet, so um, I'm a David Mamet uh, fan. Um, John Favreau was a close friend of mine and um, one of the most decent people that I've ever known. So I love to see uh, the great success he's achieved since he and I worked together when he first was first beginning. Uh, Noah Baumbach, of course, these are, you know, all the, and Patty Jenkins, all the, the directors I worked with, um, and Keen and I've in seven decided these are, they remain friends of mine and uh, I have close relationships with them and they were just good people and, and all uh, in their different ways, uh, you know, gifted. Um, Hitchcock, of course, hugely important to me because the ultimate cinemast and understood how cinema worked, not just through script, but through um, uh, all the devices and mechanisms that I subsequently uh, employed. Um, you know, just so many. Kurosawa, um, I love the humanity of Kurosawa. Um, and if I go down that humanity channel, then Renoir is hugely important to me. Uh, Truffaut is very important to me. Frank Capra is very important. Um, all these people who loved um, their characters and recognized that through their many and varied foibles, um, uh, ultimately uh, we should care about each other. Um, and it comes uh, across in their films um, and you love them, um, those characters for it. Uh, and a more modern interpreter of those approaches would be Richard Curtis. Um, who's written and made some of my, you know, favorite films. I mean, um, I, people call them guilty pleasures. I just think they're well crafted. A film like Love Actually, I think it's just perfectly made. But again, you come away with this sense of our shared humanity and, and caring about the characters and to write characters that are both believable and that you care about for all the um, contrived manipulations of those scripts are just delightful, um, guilty pleasures. So, um, and I can, you know, go on. Douglas Sirk, I thought was fantastic because he was, uh, wrote 50s melodramas, but was so wonderfully subversive at the same time. So working within the um, uh, studio system is, is uh, you know, kind of very special. Uh, Kazan, um, for his directing of actors, I mean, on the waterfront, um, very much my style of, of, of acting. Um, Streetcar Named Desire, I mean, just, a, a, you know, a master of, of those things. So, um, and then the film noir, you know, I like them all. I love the, the language of Howard Hawks, um, that, that I still use overlapping and uh, uh, characters with different purposes speaking simultaneously, I learned from Hawks. So a film like Philadelphia Story is just as, as perfect as a film could be made, um, you know, and then, so I can, so I get hot and, and, you know, there's just so many other directors and films that I like, but that's a good starting list. I think, I, I, I think that the, the only career achievement is, is um, survival and perseverance, um, not to, to give up 
um, on um, myself, on life, uh, on uh, my own uh, evolution, creatively, spiritually, um, to keep going. Um, I never checked out um, or um, phoned it in, another great American expression. I, I was always engaged, I still am engaged, I'm still reinventing myself. Um, for good or for bad. Uh, I think people would like a greater consistency for me, but I'm just, I have so many interests that I'm constantly learning new things and new approaches and uh, trying to um, evolve. So um, the fact that I'm still here, still making films, um, still traveling to film festivals, still talking about movies, um, and it's been over 40 years now, that to me is a considerable uh, achievement. I'm also oddly proud of how varied um, the work is that I did. Um, so the fact that I could shoot um, two or three of the most successful comedies of all time, um, but also shoot an Oscar winning independent film um, and also shoot uh, a TV series, which I got the ASC nomination. Um, and the fact that I've written um, screenplays that people consider weighty and intellectual um, uh, and did all these things uh, in one lifetime. Um, may have done them all poorly, but it certainly has been varied and I'm still here. So I guess that's an achievement, I guess. Um, you know, I thought it would be a great thing to put on, on my tomb um, that he's still here, but of course I wouldn't be. Um, so maybe it should be, he was still here until he wasn't, um, <laughs> which might be the ultimate um, accolade. for me um and anecdotes uh, my favorite always is the terry cruz story that terry um was virtually unknown when um we flew him up to vancouver to appear in white chicks and um he was going to do this dance sequence where um the idea was to have him do a couple of moves and then bring in a body double who's a real dancer and um terry was really one of the if not the most lovely person in all of hollywood this big family and his adoring wife and just a great relationship and just great people to be around, saw this as a, an opportunity to go from a bouncer in a comedy store in a, a comedy club in Hollywood to you know maybe getting a, a job as a working actor. Um, and he practiced this dance that he had in mind and practiced and practiced and practiced. And all the cameras were set up and um, we gave him this instruction start your move step out we'll bring in the body double and terry took off his shirt with his fantastic physique and uh the music started and um you know for me i'm so disassociative that until real life resembles a movie it doesn't seem real um and terry began this incredible now legendary dance and everybody uh, on the periphery of the set stopped turned and looked uh, just like in a movie but it was a movie um and that wasn't the stuff that was on camera and all our mouths were a gap. Where's Littrell? On the dance floor. And um, we pointed all the cameras at him and we just waited for him to finish. There was a pause, like in a movie, where uh, Terry wondered if he had done something terribly wrong and overstepped um, the limits of what he was meant to do. And the pause was because people were genuinely stunned. And then a spontaneous uh, applause began rippling through the hundreds of extras, the crew, um, everybody was there. And it went on and on and on, people cheering and clapping. And it was just one of those most delightful experiences that you can see in life. And then Terry went on, of course, to um, an incredible career of TV series, movies, commercials, uh, um, and just somebody you will always uh, root for. I just saw him the other day. He's just built a studio for himself in, in uh, Hollywood, uh, Pasadena, which uses virtual reality material and things. And he's just doing, and now he's got a new book coming out just one of the great human beings. And also in that film, of course, uh, there's a scene where he sings. Um, making my way back home by yeah. um uh, in the car and uh those little moves a little head move that he does um uh all made up all improvised it was it was
again, a little comedy, um, you know, not somebody who's going to win an Oscar, but um, just to see what happened to his career and the delight those scenes brought was, was uh, you know, fantastic. And then the other anecdote, I guess, would be on Monster when um, the, the script was so ambitious and we had such a small sum of money that, um, you know, we didn't know how we could get it through the day, get through the day with the number of shots that Patty had. So we evolved a style where I would handhold everything well, the lights would move on some um, fish poles. Uh, so the, the lighting would move with the actor. We took up all the marks so Shirley could go wherever she wanted. And we just began shooting. And typically on a feature, you might do 10, 15 setups a day, um, you know, maybe 20 if you're incredibly ambitious and lucky. We were doing 40 to 60 setups a day and um, racing through things, but getting breathtaking performances that went on to win an Oscar. We can be as different as we want to be, but you can't kill people. Says who? You know, those are some of the magical experiences, but I've you know, worked on nearly 100 films, TV shows, uh, um, you know, independent studio projects, everything else. Um, so I've had lots of remarkable experiences, some bad ones as well, which I evacuate, but uh, a lot of a lot of good ones. And as I say, um, you know, my greatest achievement, I'm still here and still working. So um, I love going to film festivals. You know, I love, um, you know, when, when we showed Last Call in Tallinn, which is a place that we figured uh, no one's going to get this film. Um, it won't do well. You know, standing ovation after standing ovation, win Best Actor for Reese. Um, uh, you know, and we began to understand there was an enthusiasm for the film. Took it to Brazil. Um, and we said, okay, Brazilian audience, are they going to get this movie? Um, four major newspapers in Brazil, all four called it Oscar worthy. Um, mm -hmm. And again, standing ovations at every screening. So uh, it's great shooting movies, but who doesn't want a standing ovation in their life? And as a filmmaker, how often do you get to step onto stage and they say, now Steve Bernstein, director of, of was then called Dominion, and then, you know, five in a standing ovation. That's what we all need in life. I, I, and I, I so love people and understand um, how, how difficult and dangerous a place life is. I think everybody deserves a standing ovation. So um, it's great when we actually get them. So, you know, more experiences that I've had. I remember when I wrote my first book and the package arrived, it wasn't so much I wanted to look at the pages. I just like, I loved lifting the box up with all these copies of the book. And I, I still remember, you know, that experience. Um, you know, I, I, so it's hard to say uh, any single experience that film has bought to me, but um, I, I love the complexity of life it's offered me. And every day is difficult, um, but edifying. And um, I'm on a journey without direction or certainty or understanding, but it's always exciting. Film is, is, is life um, observed. So we spend very little time because we don't have the time in careful rumination um, about the meaning of things. But film, even the comedies, ultimately are about the distillation and examination of meanings. So it's like an enforced meditation that each day we're doing a scene with an actor, we talk about motivation, not just as an acting device, but really looking at ourselves, what motivates us, what causes us to act, what others cause, what causes others to act and in particular ways and fashion. So it's really looking at our natures and what better occupation is there than looking at our natures and coming to an understanding of um, why we do things um, and what genuine virtue is and um, what uh, isn't virtue. Um, and I think that's a, a worthy and um, worthwhile way to spend uh, a life. I also think that because the making of the films is to do with collaboration, so much of uh, it is, is about human interaction. And through interaction, again, comes an understanding of other people's needs um, and our own and how we can be um, better people, better both in the sense of, of doing good things and um, being empathic, 
but better also in how to mediate life and extract from it things of value um, and insights and wisdoms so that um, we can um, better navigate our futures.